Hello, I'm Maria Ressa, and this is Talk Thursday. With me today, a real privilege to have him, is Winston Damarillo, the chairman and co-founder of Exist Global Incorporated. He is also the CEO of Morph Labs. He describes himself as a geek, an entrepreneur, and a Pinoy. Winston, it's good to have you here. Good, and, and thank you very much for having me. I'm a big fan of Rappler. I'm actually very excited to meet you today and, and very nervous as well to see your, your team working in Rappler. You well, guys are, I'm your biggest fan. I, uh, you know, I'm excited oh to see you. Okay. I would like to add Anna Lasselite as well because that's what my sister is signaling me <laughs> over there. <laughs> um, I have to tell you a little bit more about him so you understand the modesty of this man. Um, he, at 30 years old, he became an entrepreneur, built his own company, and then sold it a few years later for, oh, about $100 million to IBM. He is Silicon Valley, a Filipino who's been very successful in Silicon Valley, and he is in the Philippines um, back to help Filipinos. Well, let me just jump back to him. Um, Winston, you... What made you different? What made you successful? Um, I think uh, good fortune for one, great mentors uh, for another, and that's the reason why um, one form of for me to give back is to not just be a mentor myself, but to encourage other mentors to come to the Philippines and and bring about the next generation of Pinoy entrepreneurs. But I've been very lucky. Uh, I had great education, you know, here in La Salle, and only La Salle. I, I, I keep telling people that. You know, all you need to succeed in the global industry and even in Silicon Valley is a LaSallean La education, right? So, uh, well, for people who don't really understand what you do, what is Morph Labs? What do you do now? So, I am a technologist. So, I build businesses that evolve around technology. Uh, I started in information technology. I was fascinated by the ability of information technology to increase productivity, to bring about equality in business, to build great wealth in companies like Google and Yahoo and Facebook and and that kind of stuff. So I was fascinated by it. Started with that. Uh, I took what I've learned as an industrial engineer. I've acquired the technology talent to be in Silicon Valley. Uh, I tried several times to get into either IBM, Microsoft, or Intel, and, or Intel, and yes. I finally got to Intel. After and a lot of after tries. a lot of tries, right? And and really finding the angles to get there. I remember, I was competing with graduates of Berkeley and MIT, and and you know and. Uh, and uh, Harvard. Sure. So I had to find a way to get there as, as somebody uh, who's an immigrant in the country. But um, I learned a lot at Intel. It, it, it was a fascinating experience. I got to build technology. I got to understand strategic alliance and product marketing. And I got into venture capital as well. And that's when I noticed it's more fun on the other side. So I ended up building companies because that, that felt like it's a lot more rewarding than it is now. Um, you're doing something exciting with Morph Labs right now. Could you tell us more about it? Yes, Morph Labs is a cloud computing infrastructure company. So when we talk about cloud computing, what we, what we think is Facebook, Twitter, all the cloud applications, right? right? So underneath those cloud applications is an infrastructure that makes it happen, right? So uh, the infrastructure that makes cloud computing happen are the servers that are um, combined together and composed as an aggregated big computer that has the ability in software to scale up and down yes. and it acts like a utility uh, plan so you don't have to buy your own servers, right? So all this plumbing or infrastructure that makes cloud computing work, is, there's got to be a technology to be built to do that, right? right. And that's what Morph Labs did. Uh, what, I'm, I'm more pr uh, what I'm really excited to talk about when I talk about Morph Labs is the fact that it's built here in Cebu, right? The or origins of Morph, La Morph Labs is actually in, in um, Asia Town Park in Cebu uh, right. when we built the first ideas of the technology and we kind of did our first, okay, let's go build this company at Maktan Shangri-La, right? So we talked about, okay, let's do this. Four years ago, when people hardly talked about cloud, cloud computing, computing or, right. or whatever that is. And now you have a, a big deal. So since then, yes. um, Morph Labs uh, has uh, been deployed in data centers around the world, in Japan, the United States, and, and here in the Philippines at Globe Telecom. Uh, but what's even more excited about, exciting about that is we've been working with Dell Computers and we've been marketing this product together as a jointly designed, jointly marketed technology uh, that is um, for use of cloud computing, not just in the big data centers, but making cloud computing also more democratized, right? Making it smaller, smaller, low power, so you can bring your own piece of your cloud into your enterprise. So that's the other thing we're doing. And, and, and like I said, I'm extremely proud that uh, we've taken this product that is built here in the Philippines, and I can put it right next to any of the product and say, potentially best in the world. Mm -hmm. 
very few people though who get to the level of success that you've achieved. I mean, what what advice would you give? I would the the main advice is just do it. Right. Don't wait for any other reason not to do it. Right. It's not about their educational system or the lack of capital or I'm in the Philippines or anything along those lines. If if you have passion for something yes. and you will be happy that you feel like you'd be happy executing on that passion, do it now. I mean, don't wait for any other reason to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's actually even easier now. Um, you've got cloud computing that makes the development of startups like Rappler, you know, easy to implement, right? right? You don't have to build servers and data centers and all that stuff to do it. You've got the power of global marketing. Any product that makes sense right. can be sold on the internet. You can build a tiny little app and put it in the Apple App Store and you have a shot at, you know, building as, you know, a, a Angry Birds or Zynga if you're doing it in Facebook. So it's even easier now to be a startup. It's even more competitive now to be a startup. It's even more important to have passion in becoming one and becoming an entrepreneur. It's not a postponable thing. Yeah, right? it's if you want to be equalizing. entrepreneur, you got to do it now. Yeah. Um, you're here for Hack to Hatched. Tell us what that is. So Hack to Hatch is uh, first ever in the Philippines. Uh, we're trying to combine the idea of trying to get people's idea, getting people to talk about their ideas and articulate it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, with the ability to instantiate that idea on a prototype okay. and then uh, what's unique about Hatch, Hack to Hatch is we're actually inviting mentors, the best film um, entrepreneurs and venture capitalists to come to the Philippines and do one-to-one -one mentoring. Mm -hmm. I think that's never been done here. We have, you know, Adado Banatao, Sheila Marcelo, and Eric oh, Melunas, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and myself uh, to actually sit down with entrepreneurs and say, hi, I, I like your idea. Mm -hmm. This is what we think we should take a look at. And play like almost X Factor. There's a mentor. Sure that's helping a particular contestant. And at the end of it, uh, they will be judged. Mm -hmm. And the other aspect that's unique here is we're actually gonna provide instant seed funds at the end of the event. They actually might get funded at the end of, of the whole weekend. So we're excited about it. Uh, we think it's a combination of sharing our knowledge and our mentorship and also putting our money where our mouth is, where we really wanted to make entrepreneurs and instantiate their ideas and, and make it happen. Following Hack to Hatch, we're gonna back it up with Silicon Valley comes to the Philippines, which is more of a macro conversation, right? It's right. just taking the formula that has worked in areas like the Silicon Valley and using that as a catalyst for implementing uh, entrepreneurship uh, boosters in countries like the Philippines. And then we're gonna add the local and regional flavor to it, mm -hmm. where we're gonna talk about uh, how we can implement these successful concepts in the setting of the Philippines and who are the stakeholders. What is standing in the way of the Philippines? Nothing. It's actually us, <laughs> right? And so um, if you look at successful transitions into an industry, and with PhilDev, uh, to which I'm a trustee of, we believe that uh, more important than uh, the most important advocacy is economic wealth, you know, propagation. Correct. We want the country to be wealthy. Uh, we, want the we want the country citizens to partake in the opportunity of a next 11 country to which we are. Right. And uh, we believe that the path to get there is through technology. Okay. And we want to encourage more technology endeavors in the country, the entire life cycle. Wanting to take that in high school and elementary. Uh, wanting to have ad uh, advanced degrees in technology mm -hmm. and having technologists as um, uh, as entrepreneurs. There are really disparate strands though in the Philippines. I mean, you have the really good programmers. People seem to know that, um, but they're working on their own. Uh, you have an educational system that's still relatively antiquated. How, how do you, um, and, and in a class structure that doesn't necessarily help entrepreneurs. How do you address these Well, things? so um, the educational system, you know, one of the biggest revelation to me, Maria, about five years ago is I've always thought the Philippines is a great educational system. Let me debunk the myth. We're not. <laughs> it's not that good. Particularly not for technology. <laughs> not right? for technology, right? Um, we've lagged behind, sadly, um, and fortunately we can fix this. But just let's start with being true to ourselves, right? Okay. Uh, Philippines, Filipinos at one point, I thought, myself included, that we had the best educational system in the Philippines. We no longer have that in Asia, right? And that, that's the first thing to fix. And I think yeah. Dado actually showcase this by you know developing ERDT which is the program we created to to add the number of PhDs and master uh, practitioners in the Philippines as a starting point this takes time yes uh, so the educational system needs to be fixed uh, the other thing that we need to work on is 
actually an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Correct. This does not work if entrepreneurship endeavors are siloed, right? So we need to have an ecosystem that starts with idea makers, combination of uh, idea and execution, mm -hmm. financing that makes it e execution reality, mm -hmm. and companies like, you know, the conglomerates that would basically scale those ideas into industries. Right? That's what we need. That's an entire ecosystem to be built up. And it's an effort that has to be done in parallel. Mm -hmm. And it's an effort that has to be done uh, you know, inward, so we should self-realize that we want to do this as Filipinos in the country with the help of uh, Filipinos that are not in the country, right? We have an incredible wealth of about 10 million Filipinos that, are, that have uh, left the country, so th uh, sought out um, better opportunities, but still left their hearts in the country that wants to continue to help. So we have an opportunity to, to, to help there. Where do we stand in terms of technology globally? Well, let's, let's put this in concentric circles. Sure. Globally, I think we, we're not in the map yet, right? Okay. The Filipinos are not known yet to be technologies, and let's narrow that field a little bit. Uh, Asia, maybe. ASEAN, we have an opportunity to be the leader, right? The Filipinos are regarded as, as better technologists than most of our partners in ASEAN. We have a BPO sector that has driven um, uh, our markets from a non-existent industry about 10 years ago mm -hmm. to market leader now even beating mm -hmm. India call center. We're number one now globally in BPO, And now right? we're number one globally. Yeah. What we need to do is step that up. We need to move to the next sector, non-voice BPO, to software, and eventually to building products here in the country. And what role now do you see? Well, sorry, the last part on the macro issue is um, legislation, systems, the, you know, the fact that if you're starting a business, corruption is rampant. I know I'm throwing <laughs> things at you, but you know, how do you how do you help the entrepreneurs get it's, through? It's such things? a relief not to be a part of the political system because you can speak your mind a little bit. Correct. Better. That's why uh, I'm asking <laughs> you about it. <laughs> the first answer is it shouldn't matter, right? Nothing the government can do now uh, can help us immediately. There's one thing the government's doing well, which is ending corruption and being very, very visible in ending corruption. And if that's all we're going to get done in the next few years, we've already accomplished a lot. The confidence in investing in the Philippines is extremely high. It's simply because we've already accomplished that. Right. Right. So th the main thing is being addressed really well. And I thank the administration and the government for doing that. Uh, the rest are boosters. And boosters can happen at any point in time. So uh, obviously, we need to continuously to improve our educational system. I think we have great people there in Secretary Likwanan and um, uh, or you know, uh, even the K-12 movement we're doing that. That's that's being fixed on its own time. Um, I wish we had Singapore's you know will in co-financing startups here because yes. we have a great great opportunity to do that. But you know that's something that uh, we'll need to just continuously advocate to the Department of Finance and everybody that gets involved in that and by showing examples. Right. right? And so. Uh, when we start talking about businesses, we, we need to start talk about it in the context of what does this mean to the country and therefore the government. So when you talk to DTI, you say how many jobs are you creating and how much GNP growth you're going to bring about. When you talk to finance, how much tax revenue are going to bring out of this thing. So when it starts to make sense like that, yeah. you know what it's really, what's really important is to vector that into an ecosystem, right? Now down to the street. This is what I always always talk to my my um, colleagues at PhilDeb is that. You know, we, we need to balance what we do on the forums and the podiums and the speeches that we do to rolling our sleeves, being on the field, talking yes. to an entrepreneur, right? And making them feel like this success is accessible. That I can do that, I can aspire for big things. So they even begin to try, they take the first step. And they will step. try, right? And you, and you take them along the way to do that. You have a foot in both <laughs> worlds. Mm -hmm. um, you're in Silicon Valley and you also have companies in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a difficult balancing act? No, it's actually essential. Um, I have tried so many ways. I started building a company in the US. I figured, hey, I'm Filipino. I'm not taking advantage of the great human capital I can get in the Philippines. Right. Then I kind of vectored, OK, let's build a Philippine company. And you know, whether we like to say it or not, we're not ready to be globally uh, in world building world-class product on our own in the Philippines by ourselves at this point. Is that um, culture, experience? A good part of it is direct exposure to the market. It's Correct. easier to build a product when you know who you're selling it to. Yes. Right. So that's just not in the US. Yes. Hard to think about products in the yes. US. Second is culture. Yeah. Right. Our bar needs to be high. And if you look at industries like our software industry, for instance, if you look at the percentage of Filipino engineers, software engineers 
employed by non-Filipino companies doing subcontracting work, it's, it's sad, <laughs> right? More than 80% are not you know, employed in a Filipino company nor building Filipino products. So the retention of, of income uh, to our local economy is not that great, right? We, we have an average of $16,000 per Filipino engineer revenue retention in our in local industry. So that needs to change, right? right? So I, I think that, that we need to continue to improve on to that. We need to like maximize the potential of the Filipino ingenuity, right? So I have that balance mm -hmm. and what I have decided now and what's become a reusable, repeatable framework for my business as I built it is to have a hybrid, yes. to have a Silicon Valley office all the time mm -hmm. and Filipino engineering all the time. And what I do is I, I, is I actually um, have people go back and forth. I have Americans coming to the Philippines. They've come to learn the people and the culture and have fallen in love with it. I have Filipinos that have gone to Silicon Valley and have set a new bar for themselves. They say, oh, this is pala, it's global standards, right? Technology and cultural transfer Technology is what cultural you're doing. Transfer. And that's the way to, it's an accelerator. I think that's a way to boost uh, our ecosystem. And that's one of the formulas we're trying to share at Hack to Hatch. It's worked for me definitely, and it's not a trade secret. Yes. <laughs> and it's certainly something that the more the more we implement, and the more people, it, it's rising tides lifts all boats, right? That works ex exactly here for the tech industry, and uh, Dado would say this over and over again: it's time we're ready. Yes. And so that catalytic event is what we're looking for, and I think in your space it's called the viral moment, right? Yes. <laughs> um, yes. But uh, we're we're trying to catalyze. We think the timing's great. Uh, we think that the opportunity is now. What makes this moment right? What makes what are the what made you guys decide to do this right now? It's a combination of at some point you go, this has gotta change. We can't be in this rut for so long when we had so much opportunity back fifty years ago, right? right. And it starts with I I can't believe we're not, you know, where we where we should be by now, right? So that's the that's the feeling of, you know, we're behind, we gotta do something. Combined with recognition, we're now recognized as one of the world's global growth generator mm -hmm. in the next 11 country. Mm -hmm. It's a recognition that Filipinos can achieve something great mm -hmm. in technology, mm -hmm. maybe started with technology enabled business like BPO. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of the aha moment that, hey, if we just lift the baggage and leave the backpack and think about what can be with Filipino talent, that uh, we can be great. And the time is now. And I used to talk, you know, you know, in the old days when your mom tells you, you know, they want off you, right? You should go out. Life is, is hard because I have to go to school and I have to walk two kilometers. And my dad would say, I walked 100 kilometers, right? And they're always saying that it's hard for you to succeed because the, the, the odds are stacked against you, right. right? And that's usually the old way people talk about things. But when I talk to young people now, I, you know, even in the U.S., we say that, hey, the world growth is coming from countries like the Philippines, and you're Filipino, and you're here. Yeah. And people are gonna wanna know, you know you because they want your markets, right? They're gonna start building, we're, we're gonna s at some point stop thinking about building products for the US. Mm -hmm. More like the US thinking about building products for ASEAN, or the next 11 countries, and mm -hmm. we are it. So it's a more optimistic perspective. Mm -hmm. So it's, all, it's more like less guilt-driven, like you have to succeed because life is easier for you. It's more of you have to succeed because the opportunity is so great mm -hmm. and you just can't let this thing pass by, right? And it's, that's an easier message to tell our, our younger uh, entrepreneurial community and we're excited to say that. It's, 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 it's fun to do it. I don't know if you see this. Do you, this generation also seems different um, b largely because of the internet. The boundaries have collapsed and yeah. they're able to tap into what you're talking about specifically to technology, the technology transfer that you're doing. They're growing up with it. Is that do you well, see it's this? It, they're increasingly global, right? Yes, yes. And the Zuckerberg is very visible, right? Everybody knows the story. It's a, there's they're movie on, on Facebook. It. <laughs> you Definitely, see his product, yeah. Yeah. and you see that instant gratification can actually happen. Correct. Right. Um, and that um, I had an 18-year-old kid um, say that if the among their schools now from La Salle, an 18-year-old yeah. girl from La Salle who, who started her own magazine at 17. Said, she, she said, um, what we talk about among my friends is, what have you done? By the time you're 20, you should have done it already. Yeah. That kind of impatience. So how, do you, how will you harness that for hack to hatch? And here's the other part. Technology guys tend to be quieter. 
they're not they anymore actually really? okay. yeah so this is the good part right so anyway we have to hatch first is fuel the passion get them all riled up get them all excited right tell them hey you can be Zuckerberg you can be any of these guys it's possible we're here to tell you it can be done right just get them all riled up but what's immediately important following that so you don't kind of leave this in empty promises is to create the framework and the infrastructure to really do it Correct. Right. Hack to Hatch cannot be a one-time deal. It right. needs to be quarterly and it needs to be consistent. So you will do with this we'll quarterly? This will be a program, right? I don't know exactly whether it's quarterly or stuff, yeah. but our commitment at Field Dev is to make this a program. Okay. Consistent, it's run by an NGO, not by a company. Yes. Right. And it's it's run by people who genuinely just want to make this thing work. Okay. Then the medium and long term that yeah. you were talking about, so the next step. Then you follow that through with showing them a framework and an ecos a real ecosystem, right? Of Mentors that you can call when you're unsure about the path you're taking. Uh, venture capitalists that you can say, hey, help me out. You know, I've got the Filipino discount because they don't know us quite yet. You know, Pinoy sh should be investing in Pinoy. Filipino venture capitalists should always only invest in Filipino entrepreneurs. I have this big thing about, you know, venture capital is non-essential export. We don't need to export our capital. <laughs> what we need is to invest that inwardly. Um, and then we follow that through with uh, success. Right. We need to make sure people know that at the end of all this hard work and all the passion that they put into the job they're doing, that it, it's going to mean something. That it's it's gonna it's gonna end with a you know uh, uh, a measure of either happiness or wealth uh, that you can get out of it. Uh, this is a private sector-led initiative. Mm -hmm. um, you guys are doing this. What do you need from government? Do you um, we get government? great support from DTI actually, so it's a co-sponsored event with uh, Greg Domingo and, and, uh, and ah, his group. I see, I see. So, but so we're working with them. In terms of policies moving forward, you talked a little bit about the education. Well, we we'll started to get out of the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Make it easy. So, I mean, there are things that the government has done well. PESA is a great success. Okay. Ms. Delima has done that extremely well, and yes. she's a vocal advocate of it, and it it, it highlights single-handedly how we're ready for business yes. in the country. So, I think there's more of that. Um, I think with government, our approach is not to like keep blaming them and keep complaining about them, but carry them along. To tell them, hey, you know what? Growth in GNP, more tax collection, happier citizenry. But I think we're gonna we're gonna take a very positive campaign <laughs> in this thing as soon as we approach the government because we have a, a great uh, group of people in our executive branch right now, and we're very excited to be working with them. And we're we're work we are working with the executive branch right now as well. Fantastic. Okay, Winston, thank you. Thank you so much for thank you. Uh, last words. Um, you're here and you'll be back in October. Uh, so I'm here to warm up the field, right? We want to get everybody excited for October. We'll be here in October, and, and in October we'll have Dado and Sheila and Catherine and Eric uh, uh, combining with our local field dev trustees. Uh, Paco Sende has been very mm -hmm. active in our town mm -hmm. as well, and uh, we, we would like to meet our entrepreneurs. We'd like to work with them one to one and on the field. Uh, and then we'll invite uh, the rest of the world to come uh, talk about the macro conversation in Silicon Valley comes to the Philippines. That's in October 8th here in the uh, peninsula. Fantastic. You just heard from Exist Global Incorporated Chairman Winston Damarillo. He is also the CEO of Morph Labs. Uh, he is in town and will be back in October uh, for Silicon Valley comes to the Philippines. This is Talk Thursday. Send your questions. Continue the conversation on Facebook. I'm Maria Ressa. Thank you for joining us.